Hello, everybody. I am Priya Rao with the First Weekend Club, and this is my next guest for the Real Inspiration Podcast, Mr. Joel Thomas Hines. Welcome, Joel. Hi. How's it going? It's going. It's going. How's it going out on the rock? Pretty good. Yeah. I've had a beautiful summer. That's I've, nice. It's not something you hear often about the rock. I've swam. I've swam more this summer than I have any time in my adult life. Really? There, there was a period I I must have went two weeks. I never missed a day. I even swam in the rain. I mean, you know. Well, it makes it different when you can actually swim in the ocean. But I, I went to the Bruce Peninsula this uh, this summer as well. Like I I went up for vacation, and because uh, I've been wanting to do the Bruce Peninsula in Ontario for years, and God. Mm -hmm blown away by it. It's a beautiful country out here. Yeah, we went to Sable Beach and uh, all around Tobermory and places like that, you know? Yeah. Well, you uh, you sort of straddle Ontario, Toronto and Newfoundland, you know, for your work, don't you? You're back and forth a yeah, lot. I have been. I keep a place in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I try, I'm, in the past few years, I've probably spent more time in Toronto, but a lot of it has been just kind of waiting to go home, you know, and I come home for motorcycle season. And so I'm generally home from around mid-May to mid-October, mm -hmm. but I'm going to, I'm trying, because I got a new house in St. John's now, I'm just going to try and dig in a little more. And is that where you're at right now? That's where I'm at right now. I'm in St. John's, Newfoundland. I'm on the East End. I was downtown for... 20 years and now I'm up out of it and I can't believe how quiet it is. How quiet, quiet downtown St. John's is? No, how, how quiet it is getting up out of it. Right. 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 That's your refuge, isn't it? That's where you go to write and compose in between all yeah. your TV film work? Yeah, I have been. I'm trying to reconnect with uh what matters to me, I guess, as an artist, uh, I'm trying to sort of, you, I go through these periods where I have to renegotiate my own terms as to why I'm doing what I'm doing, what I'm in it for. You know, you catch yourself doing a money gig, mm -hmm. stuff like that, and, and, and getting further away from uh, your, your original ambitions, my original. Sure. Um, I mean, there's no money in books or music or anything like that, but that's where my heart is, you know, and, and I mean, I love acting when the role is good and even when the role is not quite there and you, you get, you ha you're, you're allowed to flex your creative self inside. I, I love it, but it uh, it doesn't su really sustain me. Yeah. Right. Well, and I don't I don't that. identify as an actor. I still don't identify as an actor, and I've been at that for about twenty years. So and you identify more as a writer and musician. I uh, identify as an artist and a writer. Like our artist seems to be like the blanket term. Yeah. Right. But um, I, I, I find it, I, I struggle identifying as an actor. Interesting. Yeah. Because that's probably what m most people know you as. Yeah, I guess, and that's the thing when they know me, right? So, but uh, I mean, granted, people, people know me as a writer, novelist, and a two, and I, I like being recognized or acknowledged for that. Um, whereas uh, oftentimes people will know your face from mm -hmm. somewhere yeah. when it comes to acting. Right. And I, I kind of, I don't have a resentment towards it, but I, I don't put as much stock into it, mm -hmm. you know? Well, let's, let's get into all of this because there's so much to talk about with you, uh, because you are, you know, a very well-rounded artist. I'm going to just read what Wikipedia describes you at, as. Odd. No. <laughs> Maybe somewhere down the line, but 
what they call you is a Canadian novelist, screenwriter, actor, producer, director, and musician, known for his irreverent, oftentimes dark and uproarious characters, and a raw, unflinching vision of modern underground Canada. It's quite the description. Oh, that's not bad, actually. Who do you think wrote that? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you can go in, there's, I, I don't know, just, you can tweak those pages too, but. Yeah. So, so sometimes uh, I've noticed personal things get put in there and then somebody takes it down, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I would say I have worked as a producer, I have worked as a director, but I wouldn't identify as a director mm -hmm. or a producer, you know what I mean? Yeah. Certainly the word producer is, can be fairly broad, but I, I'm not the type to raise the money or, yeah. or to yeah. juggle all those vile moving parts that need to be juggled to make something happen uh -huh. i've been a i've been a creative producer right which is somebody who's involved in casting and writing and and tone mm -hmm. and that sort of thing but a producer is a scary job in my book it sure is but you had a lot of great partners in that area right? yeah I have so you focus on your creative yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was reading some interviews as I was preparing to talk to you today, and I, I learned that it was your uncle that really kind of put you on a path to the creative lifestyle, starting with music. And I didn't really know that music was necessarily your first inspiration or love, but he, your uncle was a, a musician, correct? And then that's kind of how you as a young lad kind of yeah. got the book. my uncle is a beloved folk singer songwriter ron hines ron died in november of 2015 uh after some illness long struggle with illness and uh yeah i guess when i was a teenager i had this renegade uncle who was on tv and he also did a bit of acting and this sort of thing locally uh and he had in the early 80s they, he had a tv show called the wonderful grand band which was a combination of a sketch show you can find this on the internet too it was a combination of a sketch show with early codco members and it was about a family a downtown family who owned this variety theater and the wonderful grand band was their house band. And so there'd be a sketch and then the band would come on and for a half an hour format, the band would probably play four or five songs. And it was a blend of traditional and new stuff. And they became like, they were superstars in Newfoundland, but this broadcast right across Canada. So it really helped launch his career. And I had this, so I, I was, five and six and I had this uncle who was on TV and on the radio and in the newspaper and it it just uh, demystified a lot of uh, the arts for me you know because from a lot of angles growing up you know movies were just something that happened on TV mm -hmm. uh, away in Hollywood somewhere and never even considered that it was a path but so yeah and I guess when I was an older teenager and I fell out with my hometown and my school and the cops and my parents and everything like that and I took off to St. John's and my uncle was more than happy to embrace me and took me in him and his wife Connie they took me in and they they sort of really embraced my uh delinquency okay which was something that I had been in denial of and on the run from. They found me funny in ways that, for, for reasons that would have gotten me in trouble or would have been condemned and just really embraced my personality and, and told me. And at that, during my teenage years, I was always involved in bands. I mean, I started writing. Writing started to burst out of me when I was around 14 or 15 and you know 
perfect iambic pentameter and then lyrics and songs and melodies and I had bands going and I was singing so I was involved but I just still didn't know I was an artist I thought I was just behaving in an unconventional manner mm -hmm. and yeah my uncle and his wife Connie really sort of drilled it into my head that I wasn't that there was nothing wrong with me, only that I was an artist and I needed to find my voice. And oddly enough, my, I, my ambition had been very clearly about music and about bands and it wasn't folky stuff. It was, I would have, you know, it would have been rock and rock band for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I don't know if I shied away from it or made a conscious decision not to be in my uncle's shadow because I, you know, St. John's is a small town and mm -hmm. um, I really started leaning more towards literature, you know, okay. and you uh, started to carve your own niche. Yeah. And there there I went off in a different direction, probably because of his influence in some ways, you know. Now, you said that your uncle and your aunt um, kind of embraced your your character, what you thought was sort of like leading you astray in ways, and you were a bit yeah. of an outsider. And you've described a lot of the characters that you write as, uh, or play even, as scrappy outsiders. I remember you telling me about how when you were in high school, you guys, you and your friends would go down to the ghouls and just get into scraps. Yeah, with the ghouls crowd. Yeah, yeah. just for fun. Just as yeah. this is a thing, I guess, that they do out there. Do. But what, um, how, did, how did the arts kind of help direct that energy of yours that made you feel like an outsider that made you feel kind of you had something to prove or, or what was that about and how did the arts kind of fill something for you i don't know it's it's just i don't know if i've ever thought about that consciously it's just something that rose up in me mm -hmm. and you know i think back now when you asked that question i think back to my first novel and the energy that I had. And I didn't know I was writing a book. Mm -hmm. I, I just had to get these stories out. And part of it was a, a desire to reclaim my adolescence and have the final say on things as embellished as it might've been, you know, dramatized. And hearkening back to what we were just saying about my uncle, I was able to find the, the humor in where I came from and, and all the delinquent shit I had gotten up to and the trouble. I, I found a, a good, funny, self-deprecating side of it. And it was, it was just a, I think I have, I, and I, I still have really strong desire to connect uh, on a, uh, on a deep level with people. I don't have much time for small talk. It makes me kind of lonely. Like I, I, you know, not, not to confuse that with being alone. I'm very, very good at being alone, but I do get this existential loneliness that still washes over me. And I've had that since I was young and the arts have certainly helped me to feel uh, connected to something, not necessarily the social aspect of connecting with people, but like this communication of uh, just what's going on in your heart, what's important to you, and where you can just ultimately lay that down. And I happened to discover that it was, I was able to write because I was such a, a like a voracious student of literature. I always have been since I was very young. And so by the time I showed up to write a book, I knew how to do it from being a, a studious reader, you know? Mm -hmm. um, 
so yeah and I, I I think I was unconsciously filling a void I don't want to put words into your mouth here but um, when you say sort of feeling that existential loneliness do you mean is that in a way a, a, a sort of a depression that you would get I mean, into? it can be for sure yeah, yeah like uh, you know, a circumstantial depression. I was thinking about the difference between cir circumstantial depression and, and sort of clinical depression, mm -hmm. uh, which I've never suffered clinical depression, but I have gone through very, very depressed periods. And I would say it's, it comes from um, a lack of connection, quite often brought on by my own antisocial behavior, right? And uh, yeah, yeah whether or not writing is a cure for that sort of depression i don't know because writing can be pretty fucking depressing and lonely too you know mm -hmm. but so, it seems to be an outlet like at least it, it it's works been a great for outlet life. for me it's worked for me yeah. i've em i've embraced it it's also been like a, a terror a holy terror in my head when I'm not doing it. So when I'm at my most miserable, I can have a really good, I don't have to look very far to, to realize it's because I'm not writing. Mm -hmm. And when I'm and writing, that I feel like I'm moving forward. I feel progressive. I feel like I'm, I have control over my life in a, a way that you, you just don't in so many other formats, right? And I'm talking okay. specifically about writing prose. Okay. Makes okay. me feel that way. When it comes to television, you're kind of, you know, the creative is there, but you have to cater to so many palettes mm -hmm. um, to get to into production. It's just, it's not the same kind of liberating creative process. Uh, film is a little bit better than television, uh, you know, I really enjoy the songwriting process, even though I have to be honest with you, I haven't really, when it comes to songs, when I'm in songwriting mode, something lands in my head and takes over for three or four days. Uh, you write it, you try it in different keys, you scrap it, you re record it, you, you just find it you crack like you spend a lot of time breaking the song and then it's over and then you crash and then you hope for another one that's an amazing process mm -hmm. but and maybe five six years ago i had an outburst that lasted it was a good two year stretch of writing songs and i came out of it with um this guy yeah, I came out of it with that album and the ability, oh, <laughs> the ability to play. You know, I didn't. I taught myself to play the guitar, I, and and then it's now it's gone. Hmm. Like I don't know if the passion is gone, but like I haven't had anything land in my head in a long time now. When it comes to songs, right? So thankfully, I can move over to something else. Right. I was listening to this today again, um, and I remember you gave this to me after our last interview, so I thank you for that. Uh, I was looking at the inside of the cover, and you have scratched out your face here. <laughs> yeah. What's that about? I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, maybe I was influenced by some other photograph I saw, I don't know, in all honesty, but... Um, I have a tendency, I picked up a, a habit from Dermot Healy. You know, Dermot is, he's dead now. I had made his acquaintance back in 2011 up until he died and I was in good contact with him. He's an Irish novelist, playwright, um, screenwriter, actor. He's like kind of a jack of all. And he, I adore his writing. The first time he signed a book, he scratched out his, so he scratched out his author's name and then wrote his name underneath. And I asked him why he did it. And he said, I have no idea, but that's the habit. 
And I, I took that habit. So when I sign books, I scratch out my author's name. I'm giving up my secrets right now. And then I write <laughs> my name. People will ask me, why do I do that? And I'll say, I have no idea. And I think there was some part of me that just wanted to scratch out my face on that picture. Mm -hmm. Maybe I just didn't like the picture. Well, but you chose it for your album cover. Yeah, I did. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I also have a couple of your books here. Your yeah. Governor General Award winning. Yeah. We'll all be burnt in our beds some night. A book that I read in my book club and which terrified all of us. How did, the, how did it go over in the book? Because I hear from book clubs. It was, I will tell you this, and I wish we'd had the chance to have you come into our, you know, or at least yeah. pop into our book club conversation. Because we, we had a book club that was going for about eight years and it started to fizzle out in the last two or three because we couldn't find books that were- And my book was the last nail in the coffin. No, your book was the one that kind of revived it because it gave us so much to talk about. Uh, and it was so visceral and terrifying. And it, I mean, is John, it all ladies? Nope. Two guys, okay. two girls. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's good balance. Everybody in the industry in some way or another. Right on. Um, yeah. So it was a really interesting conversation because we could not get it out of our heads. You know, yes. some people liked it. Some people were just scared of it because Johnny is quite, um, he's quite a character. I know, you know, I would, me and my son have been talking about collaborating on the screenplay. And I was going to ask you if this could be turned into a movie. Oh, yeah. I, I, I know exactly how it could be turned into a movie. And me and him were going to collaborate on the screenplay and he would play Johnny. This is okay. in a couple of years when he's a little bit older and I'll direct a road mm -hmm. movie and just... And your son, of course, Percy White, who's... Uh, Percy Hines, White. Percy Hines White, pardon me, pardon me. Um, <laughs> I took you right out of there, Joel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I already had uh, that fight fucking 20 years ago with his mother. Well, when he's uh, carving out quite a career of his own as an actor. He is, um, yeah. But the first time I saw him was in another film collaboration that you've done with him, Cast No Shadow. So I know yeah. we're jumping all over the place here. No. I do want to get back to this and hear about how you plan to turn it into a movie, if you do. Oh, that's but all I'd say. We, that's we just all? Been talking about it. No inside secrets? Mm -hmm. um, are you not scared of uh, having having him play this My God, terrifying no. character? My God, no. He, he's he, he, Not to shit talk TV, but it's a, it can be a very confining for an actor, you know? especially someone with a big exuberant spirit like him mm -hmm. can you can you know can, it can be tough job where you know i just came off a tv show for example and basically you are delivering the lines as they're written on the page finding a way to sell them mm -hmm. right where whereas in film i just came off a movie in nova scotia where the scenes were for my character were a lot of them were very underwritten some of them had i was in the scene doing something but there's no real dialogue written and you could see that by the time the construct of the scene was playing out it needed some dialogue to fill it up you know because it was action so then you're walking on set and you're trying to your brain is all fired up trying to work out what your character would do and how that might help move the story forward. Mm -hmm. And so it's a completely different kind of thinking. Uh, and whereas TV is you're delivering the lines as, as they've been approved by the network, yeah. trying to make the best of them. Right. Yeah. So w when it comes to like my son taking on a role like that, I think it'd be an amazing role for him. He like he get to play a Newfoundlander, which he is, right? Yeah. He doesn't, he, I don't, but I don't think he's probably hasn't played a Newfoundlander since Cast No Shadow, right? You know, and a Newfoundlander is really fun to play. Well, Newfoundlanders are just really fun. They can be, <laughs> yeah. Um, so he'd get to play that, and he'd get to explore. I mean. It's really fun. Like, I, 
I wouldn't say I'm non-violent. I believe in violence to certain circumstances, right? Right, especially when it comes to rumbles in high school. Not towards the vulnerable, children, animals, women, or anything like that. But I do believe in, in violence at times, and I have violent fantasies at times. You know, I'd like to punch someone in the fucking face. Um, but you can't live like that. So it's very interesting to get to do it on camera. Is uh, that where you let it out? Because absolutely, yeah. And so sometimes okay. I'm left like, you know, I did a role, I did, just came off this movie in Nova Scotia, for example, it's called Wildhood. And I played a brutish, drunken father to two teenagers with really violent scenes, which I've kind of done a version of in the past, mm -hmm. like, say, for example, Cast No Shadow. Yeah. But I, and I wasn't left feeling good about myself or anything like that. And I had to make extra um, gentle efforts to connect with the boys that I worked with who were amazing. I worked with, I made, made extra efforts to be funny and light and that off camera. But the actual moment of shooting the violent scenes is exhilarating. Mm -hmm. You walk away once they call cut and you're like, oh God, you know, people are not really talking to you. They've you've scared people in the crew and it got so heated on camera and then you just got to go decompress and do it again. It's really hard, but it's exhilarating when the camera's rolling and there's not many opportunities you get in your in in real life to explore those i think we all have mm -hmm. a little bit of violence in us you know well isn't that what the uh the purge movies are all based on right is that desire that a lot of us have or the purge? i haven't seen any of those is that really? what that is yeah it's uh based in a alternate reality uh, one day of the year you can act out whatever violent fantasies or desires you have. Wow, I'm in. But you seem to have excelled at this type of character. I know. Not only in your acting work, but also in, in your fiction and yeah. also in your music. Yeah. You know, your music is also, like I was that, listening to this today. That album, that album is sort of linked by I, I I think there's one character that runs through that album. Okay. Um, if you see the book ends, the first song is a third person perspective of what you're about to get into. The last song is this omnipotent sort of yep. commentary. Everybody loves you when you're dead. Right. And uh, there's a story of a murder that happens in there and all all this old stuff, you know. Um, yeah, it's a fairly aggressive, violent, rockin' album. Mm -hmm. and With these some were, folk these, music undertones. I had a whole bunch of other songs. I didn't quite know I was going to do that album when I went in the studio. And these are the songs that rose to the top. And that, But now I'm going into the studio again in mid-October this month, and I'm doing a bunch of other songs that I wrote around the same time as I was writing those songs. Uh, and, but they all deal with the concept of home. They're more heightened, poetic language. Um, they are more personal. They're in my own voice. And they're all about like, the concept of home, like leaving, staying behind, looking for it, coming back to it, you know? making yeah. peace with it at war with home so that that's just a pile of song that album was just that time know, and place that, yeah and i wanted to do a character driven rocking fucking album where i could sort of let loose you know it really is it's almost like you could make a short film out of this or like a one hour yeah. film just based on maybe a maybe a musical theater piece yeah, you know, getting it on the fucking radio is enough of a... <laughs> yeah. 
All right. So I also read that you're having a harder time with these kinds of characters nowadays, that you watched Reservoir Dogs relatively recently or something, and you couldn't really stomach. Oh, where did you read that? I read it. I have my sources. You read that I watched Reservoir Dogs? Recently, that you were, th nor that you were thinking of that scene where I think it's Michael Madsen is oh, torturing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah, did. Yeah. I did watch Reservoir Dogs recently, and the, the scene with Michael Madsen where he chops the guy's ear off, and it's stuck in the middle of what you was playing, and it's a groovy thing. I remember watching that in my late teens or whenever that movie came out, and I was all over it. Yeah. And now it's, it's, it's almost like way back when I was desensitized. Mm-hmm. And I watched it this past year, and I really was kind of disturbed by that scene. I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? It's just a Quentin Tarantino flick. And yeah, I was really put off by it. So that's, you know, usually people get desensitized over time as opposed yeah. to having been desensitized and becoming sensitized. So yeah. what has happened? Is it just a stage of life thing, you think? Probably, probably. You know, to quote Fred Eaglesmith, they say that a man just doesn't grow up till he's 40 odd years old. Yeah. So Maybe I'm just having a growth spurt. <laughs> so are you saying that the time of your bad boy characters is slowly becoming a thing of the past? Um, I doubt it. Not for, not for the camera or anything like that. I, I mean, no, I doubt it. I, I, I'm well aware, for example, I'm not a leading man. Um, I don't necessarily want to be, often, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't have a generic look. If you're gonna cast me, you're gonna be very specifically casting me in something. I got tattoos on my face. I got fucking gold teeth. You know, I'm- All of I'm, which could be changed with makeup. Yeah, fuck, I don't know. But I get a lot of work based on my look. Mm -hmm. So, and if the work is interesting, I don't mind. Uh, I, I doubt I'll ever be playing the dad next door or or would you want to ever play that role no i don't think so i've seen people in those roles who are miserable mm -hmm. right and uh, yeah the bad guy's fun to play well yeah and you just said that it's quite exhilarating to be able to have that outlet of you know some violence or just yeah craziness. I've, done, I've done crazy shit on camera right a lot of fun. Well, yeah, look at Little Dog, your CBC series, which... Yeah. Uh, yeah that's an exceptional kind of thing. So that's a lead role, but, you know, it's a, it's a different kind of lead role. And mm -hmm. I like those kind of shows. Like, one of my favorite shows has been... I, well, anything Danny McBride does, you know, and he's okay. so fucking unconventional. Uh-huh. I love Eastbound and Down and uh, The Righteous Gemstones and all that. And, th yeah, th there are people out there that I... I quite admire so I don't know I'll, I'll probably I've tried to I go through periods like I got offered a job recently it's good job good money everything like that and I just dug my heels in and suddenly didn't want to do it because and I tried to back out of it I don't know if it's out of fear or or I feel like oh I've done that or I want to switch up my image on camera or anything, or that I resented being exploited or being hired because of my tattoos or whatever the fuck, right? And then I just ended up doing it and had a great laugh and good fun. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with it all, to be honest with you. I, I do know, I don't really, because I have interests in other things, I don't really have the discipline to keep my body in great shape and or I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I, a lot of the people I've interviewed for this podcast have been multi-talented in different ways. You know, they'll, they'll draw in their spare time or they'll have some sort of creative outlet. Some of them are documentarians who also do fiction uh, films. But you are one of the only people that I've spoken to who's taken his art in different forms and done it on a professional level for everything he does. 
yeah. that has to be extremely taxing on you or is it not taxing is it just you know an outlet of different sorts each of these things satisfies a different well, part of your well, soul in 2018 i launched it seemed like all in one month i launched that album mm -hmm. and a tv show and uh you know won the governor general's award for a novel and everything like that and i just seemed to i don't know how it all happened timing wise some part of me planned it i'm sure but i, I bottlenecked and i was everywhere going crazy like mad with it all and then suddenly i lift my head up and there's the book is last year's book and the album did what it did and the tv show was over and i was drained mm -hmm. I was drained and even when the big ideas were coming, I'm like, well, I'm not fucking writing that. I don't have, I, I just didn't have the hustle. And there's something to be said about once you achieve what you set out to achieve and you know that you, there, there's a naivety to the, to get it, getting there. You're caught up in the work, but then in hindsight, you really, you, you know how much work you put into it. Mm -hmm it's kind of almost harder to get your hustle on again, right? So I've been sort of taking it easy, trying not to kick the shit out of myself for not doing the work um, and just waiting for, waiting for it to land in my head. And I know that when it lands in my head, I'll run with it. But for now, I'm, I'm uh, just trying to keep things simple and cut myself uh, bit of a break you know yeah it sounds like you're really hard on yourself because i mean I you have been, been, yeah. yeah i struggle with that yeah i and i think most of us or many of us do um you know high achievers low achievers whatever but we're often harder on ourselves than we would be on our closest yeah, friends no. you you had an extremely extremely busy couple of years at that time just with projects you were driving but in that in the since then to now you've still been filming a lot you've been you've been, yeah, I've, been I've been filming a lot i went on i uh trickster i'm in the first mm -hmm. season of trickster uh that comes out now on the seventh um i did a re i'm really excited about a movie we shot in prince edward island it's called um a small fortune mm -hmm. which is like a sort of a Fargo sort yeah. of movie where a bag of cash washes up on the beach and I play the guy who comes looking for his money. He's very reluctantly carrying a big gun, right? And it's this, uh, I'm really excited about that. And uh, Body and Bones, of course, mm -hmm. is coming out. And yeah, a bunch. Of, and, then, and then I've just, just been shooting some other stuff. So yeah, I'm still going. Whether or not, I'm not chasing that though. Well, no. nor do you have to because people are coming to you. I guess my, my question was you, you, you sort of were judging yourself or being hard on yourself for the fact that you're not creating anything of your own in, the, in yeah. this last time period, yeah. but you've still been busy in other creative outlets. So for, for people in the industry, like, you know, there's something to be said about when can you feel, when do you feel accomplished? When do you feel happy about the work you've done or just where you're at in your career? Do you ever feel satisfied? I mean, you won a governor general's award. Most people would say, yep, yeah, maybe I'm done. I mean, that is a pinnacle of a career in itself. You want me to be honest with you? Yeah, <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, uh, I ended up in rehab this past year in December. I just came to a point in my life where I, I had no other choice. Mm -hmm. and had, I had been to rehab in 2010. So almost 10 years later, I was back. And I, ha I really had no choice. It was like life or death for me. And uh, I look back on the past few years Governor General's Award, for example. And uh, I feel like it was, I feel like I was in a bit of a fog the whole time because I was so busy. 
yeah and because of some lifestyle decisions or a, a lifestyle that i was embracing in private and i i feel like i was you know as a novelist for example to aspire to win the governor general's award it's like you just don't do it i certainly had never thought that that would happen to my kind of work and I feel like I was in this haze and this fog when I was accepting it, the award and everything and or like I was some observer of something that happened that was happening to somebody else I, I dissociated with all of it and it was probably because of uh, lifestyle and and drugs and that sort of thing so if there's a part of me that feels like I missed some sort of major accomplishment. Yeah. And I, I have it over here as something I don't have as much respect for. Not the work. Like I, I've never used drugs to be creative. Mm -hmm. I didn't write my last book using any drugs or anything. I, I know I put the work in. I know I hustled to get it published, all that. And then there's some part of me that feels like I cheated myself. So I'm really working on that. And this past year has been, when I say I've been taking time off and everything, I've been renegotiating a lot and trying to get balanced spiritually and emotionally. And, and uh, I'm more focused on my relationships with loved ones and the type of person that I want to be in my personal life, mm -hmm. as opposed to the heights that your professional life can take you. Because if your personal life is a mess, which mine was over the past few years, you know, I was just like tunnel vision with work and a lot of my shit fell apart on a yeah. personal level. And so then it's just not worth it. You can come out of it with accolades and a few dollars in the bank and all this, but. But at what cost? Yeah, and it's, that's just not, uh, so I'm really trying to determine um, how I want my life to be and, and what kind of person I, I, I want to, to be in, in my private life, you know? Now, stay with me for a minute, because this might seem like I'm meandering, but um, I once heard somebody describe the idea of balance, because we always hear about balance, work-life balance, family work balance, you know, fun work, whatever, all this stuff about balancing our lives and making sure we're kind of keeping the scales like this. Yeah. But I heard somebody once say that What's happening when the scale is like this? Nothing. There's yeah. no movement. So it has to be that, you know, balance comes and goes. It sounds like you're, you're talking about maybe moving towards life having more of a balance, whereas your career has been so full throttle for such a long time now. Yeah. So, I, I turn around and I'm no longer a young dad. My yeah. son my son is 19 crazy people have died people are gone from my life like you just blink of an eye so much has changed on a personal note that it's hard to put stock in what you've got going on professionally right so when you know this this podcast is called real inspiration because it really is about oh and we just went on a big downer no i think actually well, i don't I wouldn't say that at all I think what I was going to say is that it's, we talk to people like yourself who've achieved a certain level of success in order to try and make the path maybe a little bit easier or less complicated, maybe not easier, but just um, to help the, the artists who are coming, you know, the emerging artists. What would you say now to somebody to, or even to yourself, or actually, what would you say to Percy? What do you say to him as he's just at the beginning of his career and you're where you are? 
uh, and you have experienced the highs, the lows, you've had tremendous success, and yet you're still acknowledging that sometimes there are just holes there that are not able to be fulfilled. So what do you say to, to Percy? Well, I do talk to him a lot and about um, camera work. And we, 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 he's probably the only person I can vent about on this, like set life, for example, as, a, as an actor. And his only real output he's a very creative individual he he makes his own music he's he makes his own comics he's a storyteller at heart um also father son very, very talented actor i i but again he is in the same place as me where he doesn't want to identify as an actor hmm. even though he wants to be in a marvel movie but and he is currently searching for his his own creative voice, right? And I really believe he's going to direct and write and all that stuff. Um, Can I ask you something before you go on? What is it about being an actor or being identified as an actor that both of you kind of rebel against? I have no or idea. Both people would love that. Uh, maybe part of it comes from for him. He, he just was kind of born into it. He's been on camera since he's two years old. Our friends were doing short films. Oh, let's, we need a toddler. Let's put Percy in there, you know? But he always had this awareness, this heightened consciousness, because a big part of being an actor is being able to see what's happening. And a lot of kids who are very young can't really grasp mm. the nature of the business that they're, they're, they're in, right? Um, for me, acting was something I never thought about. Uh, somebody told me that I had a good character, that I should try it out. I ended up on stage and I ended up on camera and it was just something I discovered I was good at, which is the same thing I read in an old interview with my uncle. So he's a singer songwriter. He did a lot of acting like in the, 80s and 90s and he did some feature films and stuff and he said very similar thing that acting was just something he discovered he could do and that he was good at mm -hmm. and so because i just sort of ended up at it and i have put a lot of work into it as well no question it was never an ambition of mine it was just something i found out i, I was able to do okay and then i started getting a lot of work Whereas my um, creative self has always been thinking in a different direction. Okay, so first of all, you're lucky because most actors kill to get roles, right? And you've just been very fortunate. But is that part of it? It has I, come so easy to you that it hasn't felt as... I working? have had roles dangled in front of me that I wanted so bad, I wanted them too much. And I, you know, I was setting myself up. This role would change my life, mm -hmm. right? Even if it's for the next six months or whatever. Uh, I have wanted roles really badly, just like anybody else. Yeah. Um, and I also feel like I have been lucky. And I also feel like I have worked towards it, right? But still... I, I, I think it probably comes from a lot of the public perception of an actor's personality or like, a, I think a lot of people might think that because you're an actor, you're driven by this desire to be seen. Hmm. And there's something uh, narcissistic about choosing that type of job. And right. a lot of people don't know the extent of the work that goes into it. Like I was talking to my girlfriend recently and, and she was just saying, and I, when I was in Nova Scotia coming off this movie, I had a particularly long day of doing nothing. I had a really long day on set where I didn't have any dialogue. It was just me pulling up in a car outside someone else's scene, right? And it's like, okay, boring shit. And she pointed out that for me, 
because I spend so much time alone and on my own hours um, that the real work for me is being present mm. with so many people for 16 hours of a day. Um, and the most taxing part of like this show I just wrapped yesterday wasn't the work. And I mean, I was working with dogs and fucking all kinds of crazy stuff going on, stunts, and German Shepherd jumping on me, all this stuff. That work is not hard, but dealing with so many people, so many departments on, in a very urgent way and socializing while you're isolating, mm -hmm. while you're, 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 the work that you need to do on camera in 20 minutes is all percolating up inside you and you're, 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 you're having to isolate and focus on that. But at the same time, you're having to socialize and do things and answer questions and be on, right? I find all that way more taxing than when the camera is rolling. Right. You know? And, you know, when you go to write a book, you just get it. I, I have a new book that I'm... I'm going to start any minute. I'm not pressuring it. I haven't spoken. I don't tell anybody about it. I don't look for validation. I don't say, do you think this is a good idea? Do you think I should run with this? I just know I'm going to go into that book and I'm going to have some fucking fun ro running around in people's heads and creating a world. And it's mine. And I know what it is. And I can just go in. Then you got to come out of it come out of this hibernation where I'm out in the woods or I'm down in Venice or somewhere. And then you, it's like you, you look, you look up and the world has continued on for six months. Mm -hmm. You got to go wrangle up, sell your, sell what you've done to your publisher. And then this machine starts up and then bang, you got to get out in front of it. So it's like life is just goes in this big wave. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that, but I don't know either. But I enjoyed the I, I enjoyed the wave of that whole story. Come on to a movie, having spent, yeah, especially these days with lockdown and coronavirus yeah. and all that shit. It's great. I've uh, it's been great for me because I'm just home. Everybody's kind of hunkered down. I'm like totally fine with it nothing has really changed in my life mm -hmm. um and then but to come out of that my only real concern is showing up and doing a bit of creative work taking care of my domestic life looking after my dog checking in with some people right mm -hmm. i generally go to bed whenever i like and i get up when i want to and then bang you take a job and you're owned you're right. completely owned by this other schedule and you and you have to like shift your personality so much and deal with so many moving parts uh i i think that's much harder than the so, so it's it's the actor's job that mm -hmm. i don't necessarily like to identify with I love the work itself got it it's challenging right that makes a lot of sense. It's more with your own projects, you have so much freedom. You can yeah. do as you like, create as you like on your timetable. Whereas as an actor, yeah. you're like you say, you're owned by the production. Yeah. And I mean, I had a, I got to say, I had a really amazing experience shooting little dog. Um, with all, it was an exceptional TV shoot. No, it was such a fun show to watch. We shot it like the way you'd shoot indie film almost, right? What's going to go? It was like bordered on cable style where you could curse, you could break down, you could be real, you could work with subtext. We There was a lot of improv happened, you know, and the network kind of said, yeah, here, go for it. And we made this cute little jam of a show. Um which is a fairly luxurious 
experience for an actor on a network show, but it was grueling at the same time hmm. to, to like land in that sort of privileged job, job position. It was grueling. It was like 24 hours. I would, I was not able to turn it off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, I, I totally enjoyed watching Tommy's escapades. It was so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, I miss, I miss those characters, all of them actually, cause it was quite a, a it was a great cast. Yeah. But let's talk about the movie that's in theaters or coming to theaters now, Body Bob and Bones. Bones. Yeah. Mm. Melanie Oates, yeah. writer, writer and director. Now Melanie is from Fremuse and that's on the Southern shore uh, where I come from. Mm -hmm. So we're on the Avalon Peninsula of Newfoundland right now. There is a south shore of the island of Newfoundland. That's the French shore. But we're, we come from the southern shore of the Avalon, uh, which has mm, been rebranded in recent years as the Irish Loop. So that, Melanie's about 10 years younger than me, I guess. She's my sister's age, yeah. She's about 10 years younger than me. And she grew up in Fremuse. I, I grew up further down the shore in Calvert. I met her years ago. She came out to a reading of mine. She was a young writer and stuff. And we just hit it off. And, uh, and I was very delighted, happy to do her um, movie. It was great. I loved working with her. She was really calm, really chill. Was it, was, it her first feature? That was her first feature, yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, just reading some some stuff about the film what she says uh is that you were on his on her side and wanted her to succeed and did everything on screen to make that happen then she said something that might seem you know talking to you this doesn't quite seem like the what we see when we see you she said he's so, so playful and social on set <laughs> Uh, I can be. Yeah, I can be. I go through. I have the most moody days, right? I'm very, very moody on set. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to combat it. I'm trying to, I've been sorting out my, some of my bad habits recently. But back to the drugs, mm -hmm. you know, when I was using and stuff like that. And not to say I was using while I was working, but like, when you are using, you're not really holding yourself accountable to your behavior quite often. So what a habit I had picked up in, in recent years was like this demand, for example, this demand for absolute transparency from people. And the first hint of duplicity, or if somebody wasn't being real with me, or if they were saying this when they meant that, or they were saying this because of this I would kind of like shut down and write them off mm. and take it very personally and I wouldn't have I, I never had any incidents with anybody but I would just shut people out very easily and in going back to camera now recently clean and healthy and working on my character and my recovery on a daily basis you're running into the same type of people on sets because that's the nature of the business. And I just had no hangups, no problems. I, I, and I, I realized all that, any problem I had with anybody in the past is all my own fucking problem, right? Mm. But I do tend to go in, like for example, I did this shoot on Nova Scotia and the wardrobe person emailed me asking me for my sizes and my measurements. And I'm like in the middle of something home here. And I'm like, fuck that. I'm not giving, I don't, I'm not digging out my sizes. I'm not going to measure my neck. <laughs> None of that shit, right? Yeah. And I put it off. And of course, when you put off something like that, you get up there and she's got your sizes from the internet or something like that. And you get up there and none of the clothes fit and they're not really your and you're, you're wearing a shitty wardrobe and I've built up this resentment and then I'm in this. And it's all your fault. It's all my fault. Yeah. 
So I'm really trying to remedy those things. But like when I go in, then I have this resentment build up. So I'm very, very cut off. And as a, as a shoot goes on, I get more and more sociable. As a day goes on, I get better. But I'll generally come in and for the first five or six hours, I'm very, very quiet. And I can't, I can't, I'm trying to come out of my shell and I just can't seem to do it. And mm -hmm. then something snaps and I'm okay again. I find I'm very moody on sets and it's because of the social aspect of it. For someone to say that I'm very playful, I know there are lots of people who would say that I'm very playful. Those are generally creative people because I tend to have a much easier time with creative people, right? Yeah. Do you have um, a hard time being on set? Do you have a hard time with other people's writing? Like when you're on set of a film, say we're talking about Body and Bones, you know, obviously you must have thoughts about the writing or what your character would do. Do you interject your own ideas often? Does that- Oh yeah, like all the time. Yeah. If I have that, if, if that's on the table. Okay. And so with Melanie, for sure it was on the table because, well, I can assume that she respected me as a writer and a performer. Mm -hmm. And so when you hire an actor, um, writer who has a lot of experience, you're hiring that experience as well, right? You know they can deliver technically and you know that they're another source of ideas for you. But I'm not gonna go in on a set and really, really push hard to, to control a storyline or whatever. I'll do little things here and there, but if it's asked of me for sure, mm -hmm. and if I'm given this type of environment where I can improv and see what happens and see what comes out of the character's mouth, uh, I'm very happy with that. But again, like I said, I just came off this network TV show and I went and I did the lines as they were written on the page and you just got to try and sell that in your performance. And there's no time for an actor to have a discussion about whether or not this line makes sense or that line makes sense, or you just deliver it. Sometimes, sometimes you're working on particularly television. You say something, I've been on shows, for example, where I've gotten a call from the showrunner right before action and they say, can you tell Mr. Hines that that line is, uh, should be an isn't as opposed to an is not? Can you get him to say isn't instead of is not? So sometimes it comes really right. down to those kind of semantics, right? Yeah. And then other times you can throw in an entire concept that redirects the story that, that mm -hmm. might affect the edit of the film and everything. You just don't know. Film is a lot more liberating than television in general, but again, I've, I've never really worked on a big budget cable TV show where the writing is different again, right? Where you're not catering to your advertisers and stuff like that. Yeah. So I don't know, I, but Melanie gave me a lot of freedom and I respected the fact that she gave me a freedom. I wanted to give her, I wanted to make, help her make the most of her movie, knowing that it, the, the make or break wasn't about me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a delicate balance that you gotta tread sometimes and you, and you can count yourself very lucky to, uh, to end up in the type of environment and atmosphere that Melanie created on set. So, and you haven't yet seen the finished product. I haven't. I just watched the trailer because you had sent it to me. It looks like a more like a love story. Yeah. Um, I saw a pit. I saw an early edit of it, um, before it was color corrected or anything. But now I just watched the trailer, and it seems like a love story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't think it was that at all. Right? How interesting. Yeah. To see what comes out of the editing room. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Well, Joel, I feel like we could talk for hours. Like there's no shortage of inspiration to hear from you, but could you give us some parting words of whatever you want to consider it, whether it's wisdom, experience, inspiration, things not to do, uh, but for people who are trying to forge their own paths as a creative in this Canadian film and TV industry. I would say, and I think I've said this before, and I maintain, and I think it holds true, is that, you know, you're going to get hired for yourself. And the best thing you can do for yourself as an artist, no matter what part of the arts you're involved in, if it's music or writing or acting or anything, the best thing you, do, you can do is enhance your own self because there's only one of you. Nobody wants you to do someone else. Nobody else can do you. That's what um, people are looking for. And, you know, I've seen, I, I've seen roles come and go. I have done roles where I knew inherently that I didn't match the tone of the project, that I shouldn't be doing this. Somebody else should be doing this. I've done those sorts of things. I've also missed opportunities. I've, I've seen shows, for example, where I was so close to getting the role. And then I saw who got the role and realized, oh, wow, I never, I would never would have done it right. like that. And that person is great for that role. Mm -hmm. So, so basically it comes down to there's only one you and that's the best thing. That's, that, that's, that's the best thing you have to offer. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that my voice is my own. I liberally um, steal from my favorite writers and performers and everything like that. I, I, I do, I like I, I collect my influence as well and I harvest them. I think that's a, a good approach, but I'm fairly confident that my voice is my own and that there's only one of me mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, I don't take much personally beyond that, you know? And I, I think that's probably the best thing for emerging writers and actors and everything is just to not get caught up in what everybody else is doing and really search yourself to see what it is you have to offer based on who you are and where your own character is. Yeah. Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. And it's something, it has been a theme, I'd say, in some of the conversations I've had with, with the guests on this podcast. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice to hear that yeah. from different people in different parts of the industry that really being yourself, because I think when you start out, you try to be whatever you think people want you to be. Yeah. And that doesn't work because everybody wants you to be something different. Yeah. But also... Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is you never know where something, how, how, what one thing will lead to. You never know if you go and do an audition tomorrow, a uh, self tape or whatever, you know, it might be the shits of a role. You might know it's not good for you and a director or a producer who's watching that self tape, you might not be suitable for the project, but they will file. If you do, do your best, they will file you away somewhere in the back of their mind. Two years from now, right. Something might come up and they'll say, Hey, what about this young woman who auditioned for that? Or, you know, mm -hmm. you never know where things, when you are auditioning or when you are applying or trying to get publication or whatever. Yeah. You might not get it now, but it might become something like everything is always a, a, an investment in your future, you know? That's a perfect place to leave it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Joel. It's always so awesome to catch up with you and all your various artistic endeavors. And we're looking forward to seeing Body and Bones. And I believe we'll be hosting a Q&A with you and some of the, the cast and, and Melanie as well. Oh, great.
So we look forward to that. And until then, we'll yeah. say goodbye to you. Fairly well. Thank you.